Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When you hear the statement, we're all in this together, what comes to your mind? Maybe for some of you, it's, it's unity, right? Maybe we have a common opponent that we're facing, or maybe a common goal that we're trying to reach. Maybe teamwork comes to mind when you see that phrase, we're all in this together. For me, what comes to mind is a 2006 Disney movie, and it's called High School Musical, right? Now, I have a confession to make, guys. I've seen that movie more than once. Okay, it was on my DVR for a long, long time. But anyway, that's what I think about. There's a song in that movie. We're all in this together. I thought that's a good theme for Independence Day, too, right? The 13 colonies probably said, hey, we're all in this together. Uh, we are going to take a stand that we are declaring ourselves free. We're independent states, but yet we're united as one. We're not going to be subject to Britain any longer. And then, of course, they were in it together as they fought a war uh, to win that independence. So that's another thing that can come to mind when you hear we're all in this together. That's also the theme of our text today. If you take a look at Acts chapter 4 which was read earlier, that's the theme. As Christians, we're all in this together. Yes, we're all different. We're different shapes. We're different sizes. We have different experiences. We have different gifts that God gave us. Um, yet, we're all united together in Christ. And we're united in our trials as we live in the sin-filled world. And we're united united by one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and I would say one purpose because God has called each and every one of us to care. We are called to care. That's our theme for today. Now, when you hear that phrase, we're all in this together, it's similar to another saying, we're all in the same boat. Now, I know during COVID, some people would argue, no, we're in the same storm, we're not in the same boat. But in the church, we are in the same boat. The early Christians, in fact, compared the church to a boat, a boat that was navigating the storms of this life. Churches are often designed as ships. They're shaped that way in their architecture. In fact, this main area of the church where you're sitting today is called the nave, and that's the word that we use to develop the word navy, okay? The congregation was viewed as the ship's crew following their captain, who is the pastor. So the next time you see Pastor Vogel, you can call him Skipper, okay? <laughs> and that makes me Gilligan, so all right? <laughs> I should have worn my hat today, all right. Now, the Apostle Peter even compared the church to a boat. He compared it to Noah's Ark. Now, Peter wanted to emphasize when he did that, the unity that we have, the safety that we have within the church, and the care that God provides for each and every one of us through the church. God calls his people to support and to care for one another as we journey to our final destination, which is our heavenly home, that place that Jesus is preparing for us. Now, we know in um, the story of Noah's Ark that the flood was a very destructive thing, yet that flood resulted in beauty. If you think about the Rocky Mountains, or if you think about the Grand Canyon, or Niagara Falls, that's, those are sites just in this country can see the beauty that resulted from that flood. And that's similar to how we live our lives in this world. Sometimes you can be living your best life, everything's going smoothly, there's smooth sailing, but then you get hit with a deluge and it leaves you drowning. Um, maybe your spouse has an affair. Maybe your job is cut. Maybe you're diagnosed with cancer. 
Yet even in destructive storms such as that, Jesus can bring about good and beauty in your life. That's his promise in Romans 8, 28. Life's storms often cause us to realize what's really important in this life and what's eternal as we live in this life. Now, just before our text in in Acts 4, we meet Peter and John, and they went through this storm of adversity. Um, God allowed them to heal a man who had been crippled from birth. And they were overjoyed that God allowed them to do that. And so many people saw this happen that they gathered around and um, they shared their faith in the resurrected Jesus with those around them. And we learned that the church grew to 5,000 people that day. So a couple thousand were added to the 3,000 that the church already had. And so the Jewish leaders were upset with them preaching in Jesus' name. So they took John and they took Peter and they threw them in prison. Now, everybody had seen what had happened, what they had done, and nobody could deny the miracle. So the Jewish leaders were a little afraid to harm John and Peter because they knew that the people would be against that. So the next morning, they took them out of jail And they, first of all, they ordered them, do not preach anymore about Jesus. Don't preach in his name anymore. And they threatened their lives. Now, you can imagine this threat to their lives was very real. After all, these are the same people that uh, had Jesus executed on the cross. So they took this very seriously. So how did Peter and John respond to this storm of adversity? Well, what they did is they went directly from jail to the church. I'd like you to uh, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. If you need to, please feel free to grab a Bible in the pew rack. If you have a pew Bible, you can open that to page 912, 912. And uh, what I'd like us to do is to read Acts chapter 4, verse 23. And uh, let's take a moment to read that together. We read, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Notice what they call the church? Their friends. They went to their friends. And um, how did the church react? Well, what the church did is it cared for them. First of all, they prayed together. It's interesting. The church didn't say, hey, we'll, we'll pray for you. Just get out of here. You're putting us in danger. Right? They didn't say that. In, in fact, they didn't even say, we'll put your name on the prayer list. They did more than that. They said, sit around. Let's pray together. And that's what they did. And in their prayer, and I'm sure outside the prayer too, they shared scripture and they shared God's promises. And and in that prayer, in the scripture that they shared, the scripture basically said this, God is in control, our enemies' plans won't succeed. In fact, our enemies have already been defeated because Jesus lives, right? Right? And then I'd like us to take a moment to look at exactly what it was that they prayed for. So I'd like you to go to verse 29, and I'd like us to read from Acts 4, verses 29 and 30. We read together. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Notice that they didn't pray for God to protect them. They didn't say, oh God, protect us from these evil people. And that certainly would have been a fine prayer to pray. But instead they prayed for boldness so that they could tell other people about Jesus. They prayed also that God would use them to heal and to care for other people. 
Isn't it interesting? Their focus was not on themselves and on the danger that they faced, but it was on reaching other people, caring for other people. Do we have those kinds of relationships here at Bethany? I'd like you to think about that for a second. Could we handle storms of adversity here today as the body of Christ here in Parma? Can you say, I want to turn to my Bethany family in a time of adversity? I want to cry on their shoulders. I want to pray with them. I want them to share God's promises with me. I want their help. You know, we have been called to care for each other, for our fellow crew members, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But the problem is we're sinners. And as sinners, we often turn inward, and so we often care only for ourselves. We care often for our own wants, for our own needs. We care about our own time. This is my time. We care about our own possessions, about our own reputations. And so instead of caring for other people, we often misuse and we hoard the gifts that God so freely and generously gives each and every one of us. But you know what? Even though we fall short of caring for others each and every day, God loves us and he enables us to be able to care for others. You can care for others. Why? Because you have a God who cares for you. And that is why you can care for others. I'd like to read two Old Testament passages that talk about God's care. We don't often go to the Old Testament a lot, but I'm going to go to two minor prophets here. Listen to Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. And Zechariah 10, 3 says, The Lord of hosts cares for his flock. Of course, we know about 1 Peter 5, 17, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So the Lord cares, and we know that. We know it, first of all, because he gives us life, and he preserves that life. And he gives us everything necessary to support our body and life. And then we also know that God cares, I would argue most clearly, because he gave us his one and only son, Jesus, unto death on a cross. And Jesus cares. We see that in his ministry. He cared by giving up his home to come down here to earth to save us. He gave up his equality with God, becoming human and humbling himself, even unto death on a cross. He gave up his perfection, giving it to each and every one of us here and taking our sins upon himself. Jesus took care of our need for holiness by becoming sin for us. Jesus took care of our need for forgiveness by paying our debt. Jesus took care of our need for life by dying on that cross, and he took care of our need for assurance by rising to life again three days later. And Jesus continues to care for us by promising a home in heaven that he's preparing for us, by promising that we will reign with him and participate in his kingdom and in his glory. And he promises us perfection in heaven when we join him there. And now he cares for us by giving us his Holy Spirit through his word and through his sacrament to forgive our sins, to strengthen our faith, and to empower us to be able to care for others as he cares for us. And so because God cares for us, we can care for others. Because what God's care does it unites us, right? I'd like you to look at verse 32 in Acts chapter 4, and I'd like us to read that together where we learn about that unity we have. We read verse 32 together. 
Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Right? They were one heart and one soul. I mean, you can't be more united than that, can you? So we, though different, as I mentioned in the beginning, are united in Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one purpose. And that unity that we have leads us to care for others, seeking their spiritual and their material good. So when we look at our possessions, we don't see them as ours, mine, but we see them as God's gift to us. They're his that he's entrusted to us, and we are to share with others in need. Another thing that God's care does for us is it encourages us. Let's read verse 33 together. We read, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. We share God's word and God's promises with each other, confident that God is in control. And when we see how God cared for his people as we read the Bible, we know that he cares for us. When we see, for example, how he cared for Adam and Eve, giving them a promise of a Savior after they sinned. When we see how he cared for Noah, uh, leading him to safety in the ark. When we see how he cared for Abraham by um, giving him a new land and making him a blessing to the whole world. When we see how God cared for Joseph, giving him freedom from prison and leading him to be a caregiver of the whole land of Egypt. When we see how he freed Israel from slavery to uh, Egypt. When we see how he protected David from Saul. When we see how he took the exiles and returned them back to the promised land. And when we see how he cared for the world by giving us his one and only son, Jesus, we know that he keeps his promises and that he loves us and he's in control of our lives and of all things. Another thing God's care does for us is in God's care, we see his care in our care. Whatever you do for others, you do for him, right? And so we care for others, and here are some great ways that we can and do care for others. First of all, we can gather together here in worship around God's word and sacrament. We could pray for each other and with each other. We can share God's word and promises to encourage one another, especially those who are going through a difficult time. We can meet the physical and the monetary needs of others. That's what our board of human care attempts to do. We can meet the spiritual and the emotional needs of others. That's the job of our Stephen ministry group and also of our deacons. We can take care of shut-ins by visiting them, take care of our children by uh, making them wise into salvation through faith in Christ, through our day school and through our Sunday school. We can take care of our facilities, um, which is something that our trustees do a great job of doing. We can deepen our relationships with each other through fellowship. We can reach out to those who are hospitalized with visits and cards and prayers. So we're all in this together. We are all in the same boat, and that boat is called the church. We're all here for each other, and we can care for one another because God cares for us each and every day and gives us the ability to do just that. God grants it for Jesus' sake. Amen.